The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Good morning from California and welcome to Race Industry Now, the technical and business webinar series from EPAR Trade presented to you by ARP and Performance Plus Global Logistics. I am Francisque Savinien, the founder and CEO of EPAR Trade, the global platform for the performance and racing industry. This is episode 236. We're going to be talking about how to break in an engine with VP Racing Fuel. This is the second time VP is on the series. The first time was, I believe, episode four or five. So it's been a lot of episodes in between. With me this morning is uh, Judy Kim, the co-founder of EPAR Trade, who is traveling. She's going to tell us more. Yeah, so it's actually good morning from North Carolina for me, Concord, Brad. And so I'm wow. out there spending the week. And headed over to the Speedway here shortly for women's and motorsports, Lynn St. James putting that on. So it's a two-day event, so I'm going to head over there shortly, but it's nice to be out here. Mr. Brett Gilly? Yeah, I was going to say, it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. A beautiful weekend as well, especially with racing happening there at Charlotte. And, uh, and a great event that you're at as well, Judy. I think that's fantastic. I'm sure you're going to have a great time. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, thank you for, for, for being there, Judy. It's, I mean, we, we have worked with Lynn St. James and Beth Parada, uh, you know, many times. We hosted them on the series. Yeah, yeah they actually launched the uh, Women in Motorsport on on uh, on our webinar series. So, but I yeah. see Kyle and Devin are on. So, Brad, we'll, uh, we'll wait uh, for them to uh, start their video and uh, pop up, and then we'll let you take over. This is going to be a very good one. Ah, yeah, this is going to be a great one. And thank you, Francis. Thank you very much, Judy. We appreciate this and uh, appreciate the hosting of Race Industry Now. And this is a very exciting one, as they all are, quite honestly. But um, before we get started, I do want to let you know that if you have a question at any time during this webinar, feel free to type it into the chat and we'll try and get every question answered that we possibly can. But today's webinar is titled How to Break in an Engine with David Reckow from, uh, by VP Racing Fuels. And joining us is Kyle Wolf, Business Development, Race Fuel and Lubricants with VP Racing Fuels. And David, uh, David Reckow, um, fantastic host on YouTube with Redline Rebuild. Uh, if you've not seen it on Haggerty's YouTube page, it's just awesome. And it's a lot of fun and very entertaining. So gentlemen, welcome. And Kyle, let me first turn it over to you just to give us an introduction of uh, what VP is doing right now and what we're going to be talking about today. Brad, thank you for having us. You know, uh, David and I are excited to be here. Um, you know, uh, I brought David in because I know I met him at PRI last year and I 
I knew he'd be a good candidate to kind of talk about all this stuff that we're getting ready to go over. Um, so I knew it'd be a, a, a good session for us to be on. So. Well, David, welcome and uh, appreciate you being on here today. Looking forward to talking about engine break in and uh, a lot of the great things that you've got going on and especially as it relates to VP and uh, everything that they have to offer. Absolutely. Thank you, Brad and Kyle. Yeah, we're uh, excited to be here. This is going to be very interesting to walk through some things and hopefully we'll add some information um, so everybody can not have issues with their motor when they break it in. Because that's the <laughs> that, goal, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds easy, right? Hey, tell yeah. us about the background just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. it, it looks like you're right there on set where, uh, where you guys do everything. So uh, I, just kind of give us a little idea of what you're doing. Yeah, I am. So I am actually at the Haggerty Media Garage in uh, beautiful Traverse City, Michigan. And uh, this is our red line set behind me. We have our 1950 Chevy pickup truck with the um, stove bolt. Uh, 216 uh, that I can't even tell you how many uh, views it's at. I know the last time I checked, it was well above uh, 40 million views on the rebuild on that. And then over here, I have our uh, Trail 70. And in the backdrop, there's a Jeep, there's a Volkswagen Bug, there's a Model A, there's a Subaru motor that we're wrapping up literally today and tomorrow. And uh, and then I have a, a old Ford uh, race car in behind me that's our old dirt tracker. And there's a Harley in the shop. There's all kinds of stuff. I mean, you you name it, we, we've got it in here. We try to keep everything uh, very diverse from that aspect. And uh, the little known secret is this is all brand new to me every time. So when when people say, oh, man, it looks like, you know, you're really learning, you're doing this and that. I'm like, no, really, I am learning these as I go. And it is what it is. But I take everything you learn from one thing, you move to the next and you move to the next. So it's, it's a, it's a good thing. And, and it seems to be going very well for us and uh, well, people seem to like it. So that's, that part's cool. Yeah. Well, we're going to come to your house to play because you have all the best toys. So um, <laughs> we'll, we'll just establish that right now. Right um, Kyle, <laughs> I'm sorry, Kyle, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, VP race fuels and, uh, and lubricants and things that we're going to be talking about here today. So VP Racing Fuels has been around since 1975 uh, as a racing fuel company. And later in that lifespan, down towards, you know, 2000s, 2010 time, we started getting into more products along with oils, consumer products, uh, coolants, brake fluid, gear oil, uh, you know, a lot of different stuff that you can that you can essentially deck out your vehicle or race vehicle with VP stuff. And one of those is racing lubricants and brake-in oil. Um, so we're going to dive into, um, how to break in the motor with David here. And then we're going to explain later how our oils are different and he can dive more into that if we need to. And the processes that are, that you need to take while that pro while, while you do the break in procedure and what you need to do after that. All right. Well, that sounds fantastic. Well, let's just sort of jump in and talk about break-in specific oil and why it's important to an engine. And David, if you just want to kind of run with this, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be fun. So uh, I'm going to back out just a, a hair. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, just a real quick for me, you know, my background, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. And uh, I did, I spent 18 years in the automotive field, um, product development relative to anti-lock brakes and and uh, brake control systems. So kind of a little bit different than engine side of things, but my passion has always been engines in, in the mechanical background, of course, brings that in. And you know, my, day, my daily job obviously now is here. I've been doing this for the last 14 years as the Redline, well, not totally 14 years of Redline Rebuild uh, host, but a good portion of that. And, uh, and when I go home, my shop is smaller than this, but doing the same thing. Um, just, so that's my 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 backside of things. And um, so going through and you're you're you know you're putting together this engine. Uh, anyone that's doing it in a in a home shop like myself, uh, or even in a in a in a big shop. I mean, you go through all the painstaking function of making sure all your parts fit, everything is good, your clearances are great. Uh, all those things that, that go into it. So you have, you know, your, your ring clearance, your bearing clearance, um, not to mention just the flat out, if your camshaft is right for the, the package that you're building, 
And the last thing you want to do is go in the break-in procedure or start it up that first time and, and basically be ducking for parts because they're exiting the package they're supposed to stay in. Uh, that's a bad day for everyone. Um, even though the cam guy wants to sell you another cam, that's not how he wants to do it. Trust me. Uh, I've talked to them and they're like, yeah, don't do that. Um, so, and, and in the years past, like going back 20 years, let's say, um, breaking in a camshaft really wasn't a big deal because all the oils were the same. So you had engine oils that had high zinc. It was prior to, um, you know, a lot of the emissions control stuff. So you didn't have all these failures that kind of came up uh, relative to camshafts. Now, the break-in relative to rings and pistons and the cylinder walls, that's always been the same. Um, so you, we got into the, you know, the issues where camshafts were wiping out lobes at the beginning. And, uh, and that's kind of where all the break-in oil stuff basically came back to going back. But Kyle will talk more deep there. Um, but my point relative to the engine side of things is, you know, for me, the most absolute stressful time is building the, the motor relative to the clearances, making sure everything fits right. Um, and then the break-in procedure, because again, you're proving out what you did is correct and, and going to have some longevity. Um, and so process wise, you know, you want to use a good assembly lube. Um, there's always the debate whether, you know, regular engine oil is fine or whether you should have something different and what brand and all those types of things. And of course, that's, you know, when you have a brand discussion, that'll last from now until the end of eternity. It doesn't matter what's the best, period. Um, there's always an opinion, right? And, uh, but, and then on the assembly lube side, you know, I'm a firm believer in using an engine assembly lube. Uh, I know plenty of people that use the, whatever oil they're going to use, and that's fine. Uh, if it works for you and they're not having problems, you know, keep doing it. Um, shoot, I know one guy that he builds engines and because one day he, the first engine he built, he had a navy blue sock on and a black sock on because he couldn't see in the dark to see what was the right color. And uh, well, every engine since then, he builds with those pairs of socks, you know, that type of superstition. Um, not saying I recommend that, but, you know, uh, but yeah, so you get your assembly lube relative to your bearings and then, of course, your lifters and, and everything. Um, but before you go in and you have it on a test stand or an engine dyno, you certainly want to go through and prime the motor with with the oil that you're going to use to break it in with. And of course, set your timing and get your, you know, your fuel makes a difference as well, because you certainly don't want to go into it with a fuel that you're not going to use. You know, fuel offers not only, you know, lack of spark knock and de detonation, but it does have some cooling function to it. That's another, you know, further in discussion. Uh, but that all goes into that break-in procedure. Um, and then, you know, you're going to run through whatever the cam, I try to use whatever the cam uh, manufacturer runs uh, or recommends. Um, that could be all kinds of things. The standard really is about 20 minutes um, going between 2000 and 2500 RPM. Now, the reason for that is when, when the engine's running at idle, it's trying to control that you know, all your splash and that, and it's really sitting, oil stays down low. Your camshaft gets all the oiling from splash or a lot of it from splash. Of course, you get the push rods up and then coming down your springs and cooling. But the, the more that uh, volume and rotation is there, of course, it, it, it moves the oil more. Um, so that's why they're always, you know, don't let it just sit in idle. Um, and then, uh, you know, after that, you let it cool down. And, uh, and then get a, you need to put a load on it right away or as soon as you can. That's where like a, a, a engine dyno comes in nice if you're not gonna put it into a, a car right away. Otherwise get it into a car and you know uh, drive it and, and get some load on it. Now, from a, um, hopefully I'm not, if I'm bouncing around, just yell at me here. <laughs> no, you're, um, you're doing good. <laughs> okay, I got like good. 50 questions in my head already. So keep okay. on going. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'm, but I want to break down the, so the breaking in function, I think there's some things that, you know, we all get confused on, uh, myself included, um, but what are you actually doing? And one thing you are not doing is you are not seeding in bearings. So if, if you put together an engine, and there's, of course, 
maybe one exception, and that's like a Babbitt motor in a Model A because that's purely seating those in. But in any kind of insert bearing style of things, you're not seating in the bearings. So if your rotating assembly doesn't rotate very well, that bind is not going to go away. Um, it's going to propagate into something not quite so friendly. Um, so it's not for that. Um, it's also not to wash out, uh, run oil through the engine and wash out all the crap you allowed to fall into it when you're assembling, uh, assembling the motor. Um, you should be in a fairly clean environment and be mindful of, uh, you know, keeping things clean and not having a bunch of, you know, somebody next to you grinding, for instance. So for instance, in our shop and most engine shops, you know, your, 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 manu your um, machining is in one area and your assembly is in another. Uh, for instance, here we have a, a completely separate room that we uh, assemble engines in and deem that our clean room. Now, it's not a medically clean room by any function, but uh, it certainly keeps the dust down and some of that stuff. Um, and then you so but what you are doing in that break in procedure, though, is like I mentioned, your cam break in and you're seating the rings. Um, that's the main thing you're you're bedding in of parts, um, you know, as your as your camshaft is running. You're betting in the the lifter. Here I have my uh, I have a prop here. Um, now you're not going to be able to see probably the wear pattern. This this motor here happened to have uh, right about eighty thousand miles on it. And uh, as I'm looking at it, you have you have areas that on the cam lobes that have nice shiny spots, and then you have out on the edges where it's it's rough from the the initial manufacturing. And um, and what that amounts to is as your as your lifter spinning on here, moving around, you, you have your contact surface, and uh, so you can see in this how it it's bedding in and wearing in. That's what happens at the beginning, um, and then likewise when you go to you know your piston assembly, you're taking a nice honed cylinder that has ridges, and then you're you're taking the. Uh, rings and running that up and down that cylinder so kyle requested that i bring a whiteboard in for this discussion side of it and <laughs> all right i'm not real good at whiteboards but i do have a piece of cardboard and cardboard's uh, the next best thing hopefully we can see this so i'll try to I'm, I'm watching my picture here so i don't get too much of a glare um but over here on this side if you will in a very dramatic function you have your cylinder wall Right with the with the honing. So, for all intents and purposes, it's a, a file, for no better word. But the the ridges as your piston goes up and down and through that break in process, it it wears away those high edges. You still have the the valleys, uh, which is good because that puts a little lubrication in there when it's when it's all broke in. But you have that valley, and that what you're doing is you're you're seeding in those. Um, the, you know the cylinder wall to the rings um you like that yeah uh, that's good kangaroo was good to me as a, as a good general. visualization <laughs> of everything <laughs> right so i mean that's i know this is pretty crude but that that is i mean the brass tacks of it that's that's what you're after now on an oil standpoint i look at it this way you have really you have for me you have two kinds of oils because at the beginning you're trying to control the wear right so you actually want wear during the break-in procedure and then you have to switch to an oil that doesn't want to wear so you're minimizing the wear so it's kind of a weird thing if you if you're looking for a blared black and white function it's not it's you go here with with controlling the wear so you want it and then you flip over and you don't want it so it's kind of a, a little bit of a contradiction but that is what you're after. So in that uh, controlling the wear standpoint, that's where the break-in oil comes in. You know, it's low in detergent. It's it's all those things that it has high zinc uh, or ZDP. Again, Kyle's going to talk about that. I'm not a chemist. I, I can dive into that right now. If yeah, you'd please, like you actually. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So uh, like, like David was saying, you know, uh, having a break-in oil is very uh, important for this process because, you uh, you want something that's got uh, that allows wear exactly like what he's saying, because you have to allow these components to seat together and essentially communicate with each other to be able to function at 7000 RPM. So uh, 
our particular break in oil has got 840 parts per million zinc and about 1,235 parts per million phosphorus. So, and then too much zinc in the oil might actually impede the seeding of the ring. So a lot of times you'll see full synthetics or synthetic blends of oils that have high zinc and phosphorus levels because they don't allow wear. They, they want components to glide across each other smoothly. They don't want anything to interfere with each other and whatnot like that. But the thing that makes our break-in oil unique as well is that it actually has molly to not allow too much wear. So there's extra things in the oil that will help suspend it. And that's the next part is that it's got a strong uh, dispersant package that will suspend, you know, if there's, you know, during the wear process, you're going to have flakes of metal in the oil. And it's important to suspend those within the oil. You don't want them to make contact with other metal surfaces. Uh, within the motor because that can either score a bearing, it can score a cylinder wall, it can score a lifter or a lobe on a camshaft. And uh, you just, you don't want that to happen. So that's another important aspect of our brake and oil is that it, uh, it'll suspend all those components within the side of that. So um, I, I just kind of wanted to touch base on that, Dave. And so if you wanted to continue on from there, but that, that was a a good number for people to know on 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 our aspect of our oil. Yeah, absolutely. And and that suspension is key too, because you don't want the the flakes that are going to happen, like you said, and uh, you don't want those embedded into your bearings because they're you know you're going to have premature failure on those, uh, and you're going to see it in low oil pressure, and then of course you get that wonderful knock in the bottom of the motor that uh, isn't someone you want to visit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, David, I have a I have a question. You were talking yeah. about um, RPMs during the break in. Now, uh, I, I'm I'm typically one that, and whether it's going to be a race car engine, a car, a motorcycle, just you know, a, a street vehicle, whatever it is, that look, I don't feel like I'm smarter than the manufacturer. But there are a lot of other myths out there that people will say, "Oh no, this is the way you should do it." It doesn't matter what your builder or the manufacturer, whomever, says. And you know, the heck, if you grew up in the '80s and '90s, you would see, you know, "Oh, keep it below 2,500 RPM." To getting on forums, people say, "Well, you know, run it like you stole it," and everywhere in between. You know, you had mentioned getting above, you know, you know, 2,000 RPM, but is it better to fluctuate that RPM? Is it better to sustain? that rpm you know for how long should we do this before we go back and change it in conventional oil what do you what do you say to uh, again all of the different things out there some of which are myths and i'm sure some have a lot of truth to them oh yeah um you're 100 correct so i i like to i go by the cam manufactured recommendation uh on that um but i have found that again like you said there is this much latitude as far as what everyone does um you know, there's the, well, a top fuel team, you know, they just throw it together and run it. Yep. And then rebuild it in 55 minutes. But that's that nature of that beast. When you're putting together a motor, even for a race car for, you know, a sportsman class, you know, you're not, you're not interested in doing that um, side of it. So I do like to bring it between, you know, my personal preference is 2000 to 2500. That's what I default to. And yes, I move it around. Um, not like from a, I don't typically do a, you know, you know, wah, wah, wah all the time. You know, I bring it up and hold it for five minutes at one and then bring it up and, you know, hold it here and then bring it down and, and do that. Because at the end of the day, you are trying to mimic driving it. Um, I have one gentleman, he swears by take the motor, drop it in the car and go drive for 25 minutes in town. That, that's exactly, that's exactly you know? what I tell people. Yep. Because our oil, once again, is, is harsh with its low zinc level. And do you want to, we usually recommend 15 to 20 dyno pulls and 50 to 100 road miles. I've personally done this with my own Trans Am and driven it, you know, you go drive it hard. You drive it as if you were going to drive it on regular oil right. because that will uh, essentially tell the components within the motor, this is how we need to wear it for everything to communicate. Correct. Now, I'm not going to recommend a 10,000 RPM pull, though. Exactly. <laughs> we don't want that. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, even on engine dyno, um, at least the first one. The uh, And then, uh, you know, we talked, too, about, um, you know, the cam break-in and the ring seating are, are different. So I really like to break the camshaft in on an engine stand uh, or a dyno, if you have it, 
because then you have the opportunity to catch some of those things that just happen, like a leak here, a leak there, whatever it might be, that's easier to um, uh, address than whether it's when it's in a car. Um, and I can also modulate my temperature if I need to, if it's wanting to, because during that break-in process, you tend to generate a little bit more heat. So I like to be able to have control over that heat in a car can be a little more difficult. Um, I still believe it's probably the best way to do it, but there are some things that kind of hamper that, um, in there. Mm -hmm. um, so real quick, you, you had also talked about assembly lube versus using oil. And again, I, I, I don't know that we're going to necessarily change anybody's mind who's been doing it their way. And if their way works, that's awesome. But Kyle, I want to ask you, especially as it relates to assembly lube, you know, what do you recommend as far as VP goes? And when it comes to your assembly lube, um, what might set it apart? So our assembly lube, uh, yeah, he actually has some. I was going to say, ah, hey, you, you got some that. on display here. So <laughs> this is our assembly lube that David has here. Um, By the way, it's almost empty, but just. He, yeah, <laughs> that's a good thing he's been using it. So <laughs> breaking or assembly lube is essential because it has to be miscable with, uh, break in oil during the pro during the break in procedure you know uh you know paste you know paste are good products uh our our lubricants manager his goal was to make a product that would uh, uh not clump or separate during the process so the break in oil we have and the assembly lube are meant to work together so the assembly lube it's like honey you know uh, uh david's done a few videos uh on the jeep motor that he built a while back where he did a drip test on it. It's, uh, that's very important. You don't want component, you don't want assembly lube to run off of a component because depending upon how long it takes for you to put it in the car, fire it up um, or whatnot, you don't want those just run right down into the pan. You want it to stay on the component until the break in oil or your regular long-term oil reaches that component. And that's what that oil does. That's what that assembly lube does. So you, you want to have that there for, uh, you know, for those purposes, because if you don't have it on, it's it, it could run off and it might be metal on metal contact on an initial fire. Up. So I, I agree 100 percent because, yeah, you do not want it. Well, you're putting it on to be there. Yes. And if it drips off in the meantime, then might as well almost assemble it dry. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my kind of test is, is if it stays there. Um, because everyone, uh, any engine shop, whatever you're doing, I mean, you have a time lag, um, with the exception of those top fuel teams that don't, right? Um, that's yeah, where I 45 would, minutes. Yeah, exactly. That's where I always kind of lean, lean against using engine oil um, as my uh, assembly lube. Um, of course, that's better than nothing, but uh, a, better, a better lube that stays where it's at, needs to be at, doesn't drip down. And, and it, you brought up a great point. It does need to uh, blend in with the engine oil and not be a separate component uh, because that initial fire up, you have probably the worst chance or the best chance to you know, have some really big problems um, as far as parts binding and such if you don't have good lubrication right away. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions from the chat um, and I'll go out of order here. This one just came in, but it's more of um, somewhat of what we're talking about right now. What kind of load do you apply on the cam break-in procedure? Uh, in load, I'm going to assume they're referring to spring load. Um, now, on an engine test stand, obviously you're not applying any load to the engine. I mean, it's freewheeling. Free uh, yeah. That is where a dyno really it would be the best way to do that. Um, but then that's also where I'll bring the cam, you know, break in the cam and then, and then get it into a car or the vehicle to do the final seating of this, of this, uh, rings. Now, relative to valve springs, definitely depending on what the manufacturer recommends, some are, you know, you know, if you have a, a really high spring load, then you need to have something lower during that break in procedure. So you aren't putting a bunch of undue pressure um, on the valve, on the lobes of the camshaft, that that's a can be a big no-no. And, that, um, and that's also dependent upon if you've got roller lifters or they're flats. You know, hundred percent flats tend to have lower spring rates on them or lower spring pressures on the seat right. and even off the seat. So, uh, and on rollers though, you can dramatically raise that pressure. So yeah, just as uh, just as numbers, um, 
uh, one of the motors with a with a flat tappet cam was was 80 pounds of seat pressure, and then a roller cam with not a lot of lift was 270. Yep. So you it, you know that's dramatically different, and then you know that goes up. You know as the as your lift is, you know your your spring rate brings that load up higher. So you could be you know two to three hundred, or you could be up as far as seven or eight hundred. Um, so yeah, that that can that can be a problem during that very can process. Obviously, afterwards it's not because that's what they need to run at. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, another question. Uh, coatings have become very popular in the last fifteen years with engine parts. Have you seen a difference in break-in procedures when parts have coatings or metal treatment? Um. On, I see it on the, so you have uh, coatings on the bearings and then usually coatings on the skirts of the pistons. Um, I have not seen any, I'll say major difference in the break-in procedure. Uh, certainly longevity of parts, absolutely. Yeah, what, Kyle, do you uh, have an opinion on that? I mean, obviously, you know, you definitely don't want to wear out a coating, um, but I think the same would hold true whether you were coated or not, that the same kind of things would apply as far as making sure that you've got the right and enough lubricant uh, in those areas, right? Correct, yeah. I mean, Sam, I, I'm going to agree with what David says on this because you, know, you got different types of bearings as well. you got tri-metals, bi-metals. you got uh, very rare you'll see roller bearings for camshafts and stuff like that. It's going to be on more high-end race motors. Um, but you know, in, ter in terms of the coating and whatnot, it, I, I don't think there's ever been a real significant uh, change in the process of the break-in. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, after break-in, then what oil are we talking about using here? <laughs> so you want to jump into? I've always been one to, and David, you can you can yeah, tell me if right I'm ahead. wrong here. Because <laughs> you usually like to stair-step the process of oil. So if you start with a non-synthetic oil, which is our breaking oil, you want to step to a synthetic blend or you want to step, you don't want to go straight to a full synthetic, in my opinion, because you want to still allow, you want to have some lubricity there and not nowhere, but you want to have a, you know, a real uh, thick base stock to allow it to still stick to components and it allowed to not have that full synthetic feature to the oil. So, you know, we have a couple different blends of synthetic blend oils um, you know, our high performance line, uh, which is a very popular amongst, you know, dirt racers in the Northeast and the Midwest and stuff like that. Um, so it's a, it's a very, hey, yeah, see, he's even got some right I there. like the show and tell. <laughs> this is great. I told him he'd have props. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, stepping, stepping into a synthetic blend uh, is usually you want to get that oil, that breaking oil out. You want to take that filter off. You want to put a new filter on. And you want to dump some synthetic blend oil in there. And, you know, don't go a full three, you know, three, 5,000 miles if it's a street car or, you know, a couple races on it if it's a race car. Um, but, you, you know, you want to check that oil filter again and make sure everything's good. Boy, you, you just bring up something really good there, too, is the oil filter. Um, I've always been one. If oil comes out of the engine, a new oil filter goes on. Now, I've not necessarily been one to cut them up or do anything like that, but I've never really had an application that I've felt the need for something like that. But um, uh, what are your thoughts, either David or Kyle, on that for someone who might, you know, heck, sometimes people just say, well, just dump the oil, the filter's fine. Go for it, David. And, yeah, uh, yeah I, I'll tell you what, that is a huge uh uh, debate uh, with every engine that we put together on the red line rebuilds. Um, it's that I think you fall into a huge brand thing of past past issues. You know, God knows what what brings people to where they they come to on some of this stuff. But uh, you certainly want to run a, a filter, and you want to run a good filter um, from that standpoint. Now, good is I'm going to say your version of what's the best one out there. Uh, I'm not going to throw around any brand names uh, by any means, but you certainly have different levels of filtration uh, in, you know, you know, a 20 micron to a 50 to 100 and all that type of thing. Uh, there are definitely some direction that during the break-in procedure, you want to run a tighter micron filter than what you will when you're um, running at high RPM because you, you, you start to restrict your flow rates and that because of the filter media. Um, and that is just the way physics works. And, um, and then you have, um, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in it's cheap insurance, no matter how you slice it. Um, if you're comfortable in the engine break-in procedure and you put in, 
you know, 100 miles and you change the oil, you put in 500 miles and you change the oil. Uh, and, and I don't, I never go directly from break in to a full synthetic um, personally. Now, it also depends on what decade of engine you're using, you're doing. So if you're in an older vehicle similar to this 50, then you may not ever go to a synthetic. Um, you may stay into uh, traditional oil. Um, but then that's not to say that a synthetic blend or a synthetic isn't the right thing. That's again, where Kyle comes in with, with their expertise on the lubrication side. But now if you look at a, say a 2000 or a, or a 2020 vehicle, you know, you're probably going to jump right into a full synthetic because engine manufacturers today are doing, you know, their design is for that oil. Um, synthetic really wasn't a thing here in the fifties. <laughs> so that's that's an example. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, today's clearances on motors, they're a lot tighter. You know, when they leave the factory, you know, LT motors coming up from GM, you know, they've got, you know, zero 20 in them, you know, coming from the factory and, you know, that, you know, zero 20 uh, viscosity oil, that's tight rod and main clearances. You know, that, that, that oil is almost like water, you know, it, it's real thin. It, it, it flows around easily. Now you point to that 50 behind you, Dave, and you know, that thing probably runs up 2050, you know, cause the, yep. the clearances in that motor are larger and it allows more uh, flow between those, those crevices and those clearances between those bearings and whatnot. This thing's got a splash system on it too. <laughs> that's a whole other that's cool, man. And squirters. It's weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I do want to remind anyone watching right now, if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the chat and uh, and we'll ask it of our panelists here. And, um, you know, it's um, it's interesting. A lot of the things that come up and, and again, I know some things are manufacturer recommended, which I certainly believe in. Some things are just the way we've done it. But a lot of what's really come up in this conversation, uh, both David and Kyle, is that there are different applications for different things there are different generations of motors there what are you going to use it for even when you're talking about filter media you know everyone has their own opinion as to whether paper is better than this or that or how much it's going to restrict and you know realistically how long you're going to use it uh between oil changes and all of that you know kyle um a lot of times we hear vp and we think of race fuels but obviously we're talking about lubricants here give us a little bit of an idea about some of the product line and you know i know we've already touched on a few things here but maybe some of the other things as well so I, I specialize in the race fuel and the lubricants. Uh, I also, I sell everything. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty versed in a lot of our different products that we have. Um, uh, one of our new ones is Speed Sauce. You know, we've got a water meth fluid uh, for those guys that, you know, run an intercooler. And they also want that extra um, detonation resistance and power. You know, that's a, that's a big part of methanol and ethanol. When you inject it into a motor, you know, it makes power. So uh, that's a big uh, market for us. We're, we're planning on hitting that hard here soon. Um, we've got our oils, obviously, that we've been talking about for a while. We started those up at about probably six or seven years ago. Um, you know, we've got our consumer products. You can walk in an AutoZone, an O'Reilly, or any big distributor like Summit Racing or anything like that. And you can go get our Octanium product. You know, that's our pour and octane booster. And we've got two versions of that. We've got a, uh, a leaded and a non-leaded um, that you can use for street applications that have like O2 sensors and catalytic converters and stuff like that. You don't, you don't wanna you don't want to run it all the time because it can affect uh, oxygen sensors and cats, but and then anything down to a small engine, you know, like a lawnmower, we've got little oils and we got four cycle and two stroke fuels for, you know, your lawn equipment and bar and chain oil and whatnot. So that's a big market for us is the SCF consumer product based market. You know, we, we've essentially branched out very large other than our race fuel uh, routes. You know, we have gyms now. We have a gym here in San Antonio that uh, our president, he, he bought some equipment in the downtime of the when COVID hit. And we have a, our own uh, gym here in San Antonio, right off the highway. So our, our branding, our lights, our imagery is what a lot of people see. And they're like, they associate us with the racing field. But we're more than that now. We've branched out very large beyond just the fuel. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of fuels, a question just came in. What about fuels? Any recommendations on octanes for break-in or fuel recommendations? Depends uh, on your motor. I mean... I mean, I'm going to say, you know, if, if you got a 12 to one compression motor, you're going to need something that's going to have a little bit more octane to it. 
Um, David's obviously done this a lot more than I have, but it's going to be more based off your, your compression and, you know, how tight your cylinder head is and, you know, what, what type of uh, timing you're going to be running essentially too. So I'll let David take over from that yeah. for the older stuff. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, on the fuel, it is important. And I tend to hedge um, a little higher on the octane than maybe what I'm going to run eventually. So if I'm building a motor for, you know, 93, I may, I may uh, break in with 100 uh, octane fuel just to be safe, we'll say, because I don't want to be pre-detonating the piston during that, you know, time frame. And I, I don't have the uh, I'll say the opportunity to, to make a quick change. Um, so yeah, that, that is important. And that, and it does give you some, uh, again, some cooling effect that way, um, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the best way I can answer it, I guess. Sure. Sure. You, How about you, you can ahead, always Kyle. use like a, like an oct like the octanium that was just telling you, you know, if somebody just mm -hmm. has access to pump gas for this, for their break-in process, you know, they can run down to AutoZone and go pour in some octanium if they feel like they need to have a little bit extra detonation resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. How about oil analysis after the break-in period? Where, where do you guys stand on that? Um, I think it's a great, well, one of the things I think from an oil analysis is at a minimum, take that filter that you put on for the break-in, get a cutter, cut it open and, and look at it to see if you're you, you know, you have anything uh, that's, you know, basically bearings really is the biggest thing, but uh, see if you have any flakes in there from that that you want to address sooner than later um, or when it rears its really ugly head and, and you have problems with it. But if you can catch it right then and there, it's call it your cheapest part. Um, long term, absolutely. Um, you certainly can go through and and I think it's a good good idea to have a handle on on what your engine's doing as far as you can because you can it's preventative maintenance at that point for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh you know and, and I know a, a lot of people look look at a lot of these things and swear by them. And it's always fun talking about oil as as you'd already mentioned, just because of, of of all the opinions that uh you know of what everyone has and and really what we're talking about here you know are break in procedures. Um you know when you're going through a break in procedure, David, have you ever you know experienced anything or or Kyle um you know where all of a sudden you feel like it's a normal break in procedure, but maybe maybe a red flag comes up before you feel like you're through the procedure. Obviously. You know, you don't want to put a hole in the side of anything, but things that people might want to look out for or listen for, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's not just a passive thing. So when, when I, I, I broke in my Trans Am, you know, uh, something that you'll see come out the exhaust is you'll usually see smoke. Uh, that's because there's going to be residual oil in the cylinders still because those rings aren't seated yet. So there's going to be more than usual oil that you'll see uh based off of you know once the engine's confirmedly broke in so you know you might have some residual smoke come out the exhaust until that procedure is done uh ab yeah absolutely and and of course you also have it around the engine um there's lots of times where you know i may have a, a nice coated uh you know cerakoted header um that's not going to burn the paint off like uh you know anything else but the oils from your hands net get on there. So you're looking at, you know, you're seeing that and you do want to watch for it because that could be a valve cover that's leaking as a, for instance, and pouring oil on, and you don't want to have an issue where it obviously lights up. That would be the worst, worst case scenario. Um, and as much as I probably break in as many as possible with open headers, because the sound is just phenomenal. Um, it's probably not the best idea. And the reason is, is you can't hear anything other than that. So if you have an exhaust system, even though you're choking it down, right, um, run an exhaust system on it so you can hear, you know, any clattering, let's say of a lifter that's not, you've missed the lifter and the one's not set or something along that lines. Um, going back though to uh, a little bit in the break-in oils and what oils to use, um, there was a point in time uh, where, the key was, and I'll say it's the gap between the zinc going out of the oil and the break-in oils coming in. And that's where a lot of folks, you know, recommended using uh, a diesel oil, um, a, a specific brand uh, to be exact, uh, because it, high, it had that higher zinc in it. Uh, the problem with that today is that zinc went away. 
because as they added catalytic converters and all the emission stuff to diesel engines, that's changed. Um, I, I got a long story that how I learned that and it ended up in a camshaft that was broke off. Well, not broke, but rounded off the lobes in, in a mile uh, during that during that load of seating. The, um, you know, I broke in the camshaft. Everything was fine. Took it for a ride down the road and to, to seat in the rings. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, they had just took all the zinc out and uh, because that's not their market. So. I think it's pretty safe bet to say if you're buying a break-in oil, that break-in oil is meant for breaking in, not for running long-term. So it's not going to just change on a whim because there's some new EPA law that says, hey, you can't, you can't run that. You know what I mean? It's specific to the function. So Interesting. It's, it's yeah. a safe bet that way. Well, what about the flip side of that too then? I mean, obviously the break-in oil is not for long-term, but the long-term oil for break-in, if, especially if someone thinks, oh, <laughs> I don't need to spend money on that. Right. I'll go back to the cheap insurance side of things. <laughs> Is it really where you want to risk? I mean, truly. Uh, you know, for instance, like on, on, uh, on engine oil changes, um, you know, I know, I know one guy that he, um, when he changes engine oil on his daily driver, he puts six quarts, well, let's say, I think it's six quarts on his vehicle. He puts it in six quarts, drains out six, puts six in, runs the motor on in the garage, drains that six out and then puts oil in. That's his process. And he does it every, you know, every fourth or fifth oil change, not every one. And it's like, it works for him. He's happy. He's got a car that, you know, he's got a uh, engine that's got 300 and some thousand miles on it, you know, works well. <laughs> wow. Well, well David, <laughs> um, as, as we're wrapping up here, uh, I do want to ask you again about uh, what you're doing with the Red Line rebuild and everything like that. For someone who maybe has never seen it and, you know, with the 400 million views and everything, I can't <laughs> imagine some people haven't who right might on. be on here, but but tell us more about it. Yeah. So what we're doing here with at Haggerty is we're promoting, you know, drive your car, enjoy your vehicle, uh, have fun with it. My personal uh, goal is for everyone in the United States and the world to own something fun, whatever they deem that to be. Uh, if it's a mini bike, if it's a scooter, you know, it's got to have a push rod motor in it. But eh, that's my personal preference. And uh, but go out, enjoy it, work on it, learn, because, you know, there, there's there was this time that we all heard, don't do this at home. Don't try it at home. And I think that squashed a lot of things for people and they're afraid to try. And that if I had to tell somebody anything, it's like, go try, go make a mistake. It'll be okay. Just try to keep your fingers out of the way. <laughs> I like that. And, and Kyle, the VP brand, uh, again, you know, race fuels, the lubricants, um, everything you talked about. Um, just in closing here, uh, is there anything else you want people to know about? You know, we're always working on new stuff. You know, we're always looking to strive to fill gaps in the market where we may not be yet. So we're always uh, striving to make those 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 fills. Um, but yeah, you know, we uh, we're always expanding our race fuel market. We're also always uh, trying new things with fuels and trying new detonation uh, processes. And you know, think that as vehicles come around, as as race cars get more stringent and temperatures get more extreme, you know, you got to make adjustments for that kind of stuff. So we're always sitting here making the changes we need to make sure the racer and the consumer has exactly what they need to win a race. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. A really true pleasure to have you on here today and, uh, and really look forward to uh, what we can also do even moving forward. This has been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Th Thank you very much, Kyle, and thank you, Devin. What a great webinar, and uh, and thank you for everything you do for the industry, Devin, and same with Kyle. I mean, VP is an iconic brand. So this webinar has been recorded. It will be posted later on the ePortrait platform, distributed through our newsletter and uh, our media social media channels. We will be back uh, next Wednesday at 9 o'clock Pacific with Driven Racing Oils. In the meantime, we pushed uh, VP's product back on the homepage of ePortrait, so please take advantage of the platform. We build it for you, for the industry. We're live every week at nine o'clock. We don't have 40 million uh, viewers like Devin yet, but we're getting there. And uh, but the platform is open 24-7, 365 for the industry to connect and engage. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today. We'll see you guys back next week. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.
Registering on ePARTRADE is easy. To start, click on the Join for Free button on the homepage. First, search your company to see if it's already in our database. If you see your company on the list, click on it to select it. Then, choose Claim Company if you are one of the decision makers, an owner, marketing person, or main company contact. Or choose Join Company if you are an employee, and press Continue. If you couldn't find your company in our database, select Register a new company. On the following page, fill out your name, email, phone number, job title, and choose a secure password. If you chose Register a new company, you'll need to choose your business type. Select Supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose Racing Business if you're looking to source new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose Race Team if you own or are a member of a professional race team. Then, enter your company name. Please provide a website, Facebook page, or LinkedIn if you have one, and choose to either claim or join the company. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Finally, click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. An email will be sent to your inbox. Please confirm your email address and you will be approved shortly. Welcome to ePartrade.